to bend phrasing time into something clear. Well, watching the movie Bridegroom last night, one thing that really stood out for me, I mean, I I saw the story, I saw the, the message, and it's a very powerful message. Love is beautiful, and everybody has, everybody should have the same right to express their love for somebody that they love. But, what I saw was examples of two different families, both Christian families. And and I looked at Tom's family that rejected him so much. And I kept having the same question running through my mind. Would these people be this way if not for Christianity? If Christianity did not exist, if they had not been bred, raised and bred and whatever, milk fed on this belief system, would things have been different? Would this hatred that they demonstrate so very well to their son and to the man that he was very much in love with, would that have even existed, that hatred? if this religion never existed. I'm going to put a few clips up of the movie because I know not everybody's going to want to run out and buy the movie, although I think it's a movie that everybody should see. Because if you don't find... If one message doesn't hit you, there's another message there. These are both Christian families. This has nothing to do with atheism in this story. But in my opinion, <clears throat> you have one family that is loving and beautiful and caring despite their religion and despite their God. And you have another family that I can't help but think if this God, if this belief in this God, if this religion, if this book did not exist at all, how different would it have been for their son? How different would it have been for Shane after the death of their son? So here's the first clip. This this is um, Tom's family. This is their idea of Christian acceptance, tolerance, and love. I was sure that his mom knew that he was gay, but she immediately called his dad to, to come home from work because of this breaking news and she went on and on about how it was a sin and that Tom should have told them sooner so he could have gotten medical help. His dad said a lot of hateful things towards him and and blamed Shane for making him gay. It's Shane's fault. Shane turned you gay. Um, being in LA turned you gay. All of your accomplishments so far being nothing now. They said, change your mind, you have to change your mind. And Tom said that he just kept saying no. Like, I, you know, I can't change my mind. It's not a, a mind change thing. Tom called me. He told me that his dad pulled a shotgun on him. And at that point, I, I was really scared. So while Tom and I were on the phone, his dad, Norman, literally ripped the door off the hinges. And his mom got on the phone and she said to me, listen here, fucker. Um, I don't know what you did to our son, but we're going to come to L.A. We're going to find you. I think the phrase his dad used was, he was going to come out to California and gut him. I used to always have this fantasy of Tom and I going to Indiana uh, for Christmas and just, you know, going to bed and waking up on Christmas morning, all of us going out to the living room. You know, there's the tree and Tom and I just sitting there with his family, opening presents together and me just saying something that I think's funny and I look over and Tom's parents are laughing. Um, it's stupid, but it's just, you know, just, it would be like an incredible thing if something like that happened. When the police showed up at the house, Tom's dad just kind of pooped it off. He said, ah, 
You know how these California kids are. Those phone calls for those next two days until Tom got out of there were just... Uh, my heart just broke for both of those boys. It was, it was just so scary and so sad. So that next morning, Tom's parents were in the kitchen with the Bible on the table. Out loud, they were saying the verses almost in a way just to justify that the day before, they beat up their son because he was gay. He's like, I can't believe this. I just got attacked and told that I should have taken the fact that I'm gay to the grave. It was just an awful situation, and Tom, you know, got out of there as soon as he could and flew back to California. To you. So, eventually Martha made her way out to California, and I was really, really nervous. This was like the first time that I was going to see Martha since that, you know, horrible experience. I think Martha came here because she did not want to lose her son. So, so then, if you see the movie, you'll see this. After this all happens, Tom's mom does make an effort. She flies to California. She tries to get to know <clears throat> Shane, but people observing this are pretty, you know, they can see that it's because she just wants to be near her son. But, you know, in all appearances, she she's, seems to come to know and, and love Shane too, except Shane for who he is, you know. Uh, I guess she's just a good pretender. And this is another interesting quality that, again, I want to know, you know, would this personality, would this behavior be happening if not for this religion? You know, what creates people like this? I do think that people, without the religion, you're going to have people that are less savory than other people. There's just just the way it is. I think people are born, you know, inclined to be more caring and loving, and there's people who are born more inclined to not. It has a lot to do with the environment you're brought up in. This is a religious environment, and look what it created. So yeah, she comes to California, she pretends to, you know, accept Shane and the, and the relationship. You know, my opinion, how two-faced, how dishonest, it's a lie. And then, when her son dies, it's like they couldn't abuse his memory more than they did. They didn't just strike out a chain and hurt him like hell by what they did after Tom died. They struck at their own son, at his memory. They didn't even accept him after he died. In my opinion, they couldn't have dishonored their son's memory more. So here's the other clips I wanted to put up. So I picked Martha up from the airport and we went to our house. She wanted to talk about bank accounts, all these things that I, I did not want to talk about. I remember her looking around the rooms a lot. And I didn't really want to think that way. I had the feeling that she just wanted to go through his stuff. She wanted to go through all the Shane and Tom's clothes. He let her go through all the drawers. She tried to take the computers. That was Shane and Tom's. It, it's just like Shane didn't exist anymore. Shane was more than willing to work with her, give her anything she wanted of Tom's, but it, it, it started to invade his privacy, and he wouldn't say anything. Martha would make a comment about something, and Shane would just stuff the emotions away, like back when kids would call him names. I couldn't say anything anyway. I had no legal right to stop her. So Tom's mom was waiting along with us for the coroner to release his body. Due to the circumstances of the accident, they had to do an autopsy. We started talking about the funeral. And she said that, no, we're all invited, we're, you know, we can stay at their house, you know, come as a family, we'll, we'll just do all this together. She was very, you know, you know, I'm taking my baby home, you guys are all coming with, I want you to be there. And then as the days go on, she pretty much quit talking about the funeral, and about us all going and, and sharing, you know, Tom with everybody back east. Tom's mom was in the other room, or even sometimes right next to me, making the funeral arrangements and 
planning it all out and I I was not a part of it. It was like I wasn't there. It was like I was a ghost. She was a mother who just lost her son, her 20-something-year-old son, so there were no expectations other than grief. But I didn't think that she was going to hurt Shane. I thought that she loved Shane. The feeling I got was something was awry, but nobody could put their finger on it. And then that Thursday morning, Martha's like, I got to go. And Shane's like, I'll drive you to the airport. She's like, no, I'll get a taxi. I told her, like, I'm not going to let you take a taxi. I, I kind of had a, a feeling that she knew something that I didn't know, that she knew that his body was going to be released any moment. She was packing all Tom's clothes up that she was going to bury him in, and the jacket that she wanted to put him in was not fitting in the suitcase. And Shane's like, it's okay, Martha, I'll just bring it. And she's like, no, absolutely not. So maybe looking back now, it could have been foreshadowing what could have happened, that she knew then that she wasn't going to let Shane come to the funeral. I dropped her off, and we hugged, and I asked her to please keep me updated so I know what's happening, and she promised me that she would, but I never heard from her again. She was so grateful and so loving towards us for everything that we did for her son. She just was crying and hugging us and holding on to us. And I want to be a part of your life. I want to come visit. It was like we were bonded with her. And then the next day, she was gone. I talked to Tom's mom the day after he died. And she said, I'll let you know as soon as I know when the funeral is going to be so that you can be there. And then it was pretty much radio silence. They never called me back to tell me when it was, and I was very hurt. I see the notice on the newspaper, wake is this day, funeral's the next day. I called Tom's house to verify, and you know the, the relative who answered just said, if that's what the paper says, then I would probably go by that. And I personally called back to different mortuaries in his hometown to try to get information, and nobody would give us any information. So although I never heard from Martha. My mom and Alex and I, we all booked our plane tickets. During a layover, I received a phone call from one of Tom's relatives, and she wanted to let me know that I wasn't welcome to attend his funeral, because if I do show up, his uncle and his father had planned an attack. And she wanted me to know that it's for my own safety that I don't go. All I could think of is, are they going to shoot him? Are they going to kill my son? When we got into Indiana, one of Tom's best friends picked us up, and Alex was hysterical. And the closer we got to Knox, the, the more hysterical she got. She was saying, I lost Tom, I don't want to lose you also. I was terrified that they were going to come and put out a gun on Shannon. I remember him saying more than once, you know, they're in a lot of pain. It's not just me that's going through this and almost arguing for them, which was maddening. I mean, I'd be angry. You're not going to do this to me. Nope. He didn't respond that way. We had a secret relocation to kind of come up with a plan about, you know, just kind of staying out of their way. And even though I couldn't be in the church, like I wanted to be as close as I could to Tom, just being near was somehow comforting. Once I realized that Shane had been banned from attending the funeral, I realized that's why they weren't telling anybody when things were. They basically were keeping all the information close hold so that Shane couldn't get there. In the blink of an eye, everything's changed. There were probably 800 people there. Half of them were there to support Tom, and the other half were there to support Martha. If I could have one more day, and spend an hour with you. The casket was in the middle, and it was draped with a Culver blanket and all of his Culver accomplishments, and, and his mom was wearing his Culver ring. But I think it was very reflective of the family and how they viewed Tom, and not the Tom that I knew. When I got up to Martha, all I could think in my head was, I have to kiss the casket for Shane. And I made my way over to the casket, and I kissed it, and I whispered, you know, Shane loves you. The funeral had depicted Tom 
up until the point where he left for California, basically. And the speakers were all from Tom's childhood. You know, it was his piano teacher and people from Culver. It took the flowers from the bouquet that the class of 2000 sent, and I dried them so I could give those to Shane. And I saved him a program because, you know, he's the love of Tom's life. He at least deserves that. Unfortunately, he wasn't mentioned in it. Families for literally 30 years can sweep that secret under the rug until someone dies, and then you have to really face the music. And I think that's what happened to Tom's parents. They had this great child. He was smart and talented, lots of positive things. But the one positive thing that they, they didn't want to brag to their friends about is that Tom had an amazing partner because they were ashamed. And so what they did is they literally erased it from the history books by shutting down his Facebook page, by disinviting Shane to the funeral, but not even mentioning him there, which is the most insulting thing anyone could ever do to a person's memory. Fighting against gay marriage, they're not fighting against having a gay son. What they're fighting against is love. And who fights against love? When we came back, we decided to have our own memorial to celebrate who Tom was. Shane included pictures of his family, even though they hadn't reciprocated. Machine had pictures there with Tom's mom and dad and brother and sister. He brought people from Vassar, brought people from Culver, and his friends in California. Everybody was there. Even though a lot of us, maybe we weren't super close and barely know each other, somehow that same guy was all of our best friends. I wrote a beautiful boy and the line about Tom making his way up to the Golden Doors as an answer to the fundamentalist Christians out there who may believe that gay people won't go to heaven. And to that I would say, really, Tom, the choir singing, trophy winning, all-American boy who listed God as his hero on his MySpace page, really in hell? I don't think so. If Tom didn't go to heaven, then nobody is going to heaven. If you believe in angels, Tom was as close to that as would ever come in a human form. He had no darkness in him whatsoever. He was the uber positive one. So everybody was really nervous about how Shane was going to be. But what I do think is pretty cool is the fact that despite all the insults that this family heaped upon Shane, the surviving love of Tom's life, Shane went ahead and put together his own funeral for Tom to honor Tom, the whole person, not just half the person like his parents did. And he included pictures of Tom's family when Tom's family didn't mention him even once. It's like they just wanted him to cease to exist. A huge part of Tom's life. They just didn't want to exist. Anyway, I think, um, I highly recommend this movie, but I, I hope the message might, well, I don't know if the message will be seen, if, if any Christians are going to look at this and go, wow, you know, look at this family, look, look at the hate that this family was capable of, this supposedly Christian family. Or maybe that's what they'll say to themselves, oh, they weren't real Christians, because real Christians don't hate that much. Or maybe the fundies watching this film will look at Shane's loving, compassionate, accepting family and say, oh, well, they're not real Christians, because real Christians would never accept that relationship. That's the funniest thing about Christianity is like, you know what, if it's not your flavor, it's not real. And there's so many flavors out there. But unfortunately for Tom, he grew up in a f family that was, I'm sorry, a flavor something, well, anyway, um, bad analogy. Uh, despite the fact that he grew up in that family, this, the love that was in this young man, Tom, bridegroom, shown out and everybody loved him and he was a exemplary person and I guess it shows the strength of the human spirit that despite despite the odds uh, a good goodness can shine through a, a, a 
child that's born inclined to be a good person can be a good person, even in the face of such adversity as having a family like Tom had. And I'm sure Tom's family was very wonderful and loving, but there was a, there was a um, condition put on that love. You had to be the right kind of child. And if you weren't, if you didn't fit into the little box of what the right kind of child is, suddenly that's not such a wonderful, loving, caring, compassionate family anymore. So anyway, highly recommend the movie. Um, to me, it just strengthened my belief that Christianity poisons everything. I don't think that Christianity is to thank for the wonderful, loving environment that Shane grew up in. I think those people are good people no matter what. They're good people and it's not because of their religion. But I do think Christianity is to blame for the twisted mentality that was demonstrated by Tom's family. So anyway, I wanted to put together a little bit better video uh, having to do with this movie that I think is beautiful and profound and I recommend it to anybody. Uh, it'll touch you whether or not you see any message at all. I, well, unless you have a very hard heart, it, it will touch you. It's, it's a beautiful story and it sends a message loud and clear that love is beautiful. So anyway, if you've been watching, thank you so much. Bye.